In your predicament, the black character is always the first to die. I will spare your lives if you sacrifice the person you deem the blackest. Hey, where are the white women at? Welcome back to another episode of Something with Sam. My name is Samantha, your hostess, and it is Monday. And on Mondays, we watch movies. And today we're going to be discussing the new release, The Blackening. I will be spoiling a number of character deaths today with regards to what we are discussing, but as far as the blackening is concerned, while I will discuss it and I will give my opinion on it, I won't be spoiling it today. So if you haven't seen it, no worries, you can keep watching. In 1967, Spider Baby was released, a low-budget film which over time has earned status as a cult classic. The story is about the orphaned Mary children who suffer from a genetic condition that mentally regresses them so they act like innocent, feral children. It is believed that eventually the victim of the Mary syndrome may even regress beyond the prenatal level, reverting to a pre-human condition of savagery and cannibalism. They are looked after by the family chauffeur, Bruno, but we quickly see that he is losing control over their more violent appetites. So what does this film have to do with black characters dying first? Manton Moreland was an actor and comedian from the 1930s until his death in 1973. He was known for his comedic roles, so Spider Baby director Jack Hill wanted him for the role of the messenger, a character who was brutally murdered in the first five minutes of the film. Hill's thinking that a known comedic actor's death would be more of a shock for audience happening so early in the film. But whether consciously or not, casting a black actor in this role to be the first on-screen death would begin a trope that would snowball through cinema until the present day. I also want to say that Matt and Moreland's death in his role in Spider Baby was his last featured role before his death in 1973, and because it's perpetuated the stereotyping of killing black characters, it kind of makes it that much sadder. In the following year, 1968, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead was released, a low-budget independent horror film where undead ghouls trap a group of people in a farmhouse in rural Pennsylvania. It was a huge success, earning back more than 250 times its budget. But there was some controversy with the casting of actor Dwayne Jones. It was unheard of at the time that a black actor would be cast as the hero in a film full of white characters. And to be honest, it is still kind of rare today. Now, Romero wasn't some sort of forward thinker in this regard, making commentary on race. It just happened to be that Jones was the best actor for the role. Films with black actors tended to have a racial theme, but Romero didn't want to write new dialogue for Jones just because of his race. If anything, Romero actually allowed Jones the freedom to adjust the dialogue to what he felt would be appropriate for the character. But there can be no denying that even though Ben was not written as a black role, Jones being the actor to portray that character really changed the audience response to the film because it was the 1960s. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated almost six months to the day before the film's release. And it was also the fact that the film ended the way it did. Jones's character Ben successfully survived, fighting off zombies by acting intelligent and resourceful throughout the film. Hearing gunshots in the morning, Ben emerges from his refuge to greet his rescuers, only to be mistaken as a zombie and shot. Now, there is a lot to be said about a black man being mistaken for a villain and shot by a white militia, especially in the 1960s, even if George Romero had no intention of doing so. And while Night of the Living Dead would go on to great excess, many people owning to the casting of a black actor in the main role, and the way that made audience feel about race, the trademark of black actors being killed in films had begun. With late 1960s film featuring more prominent black protagonists such as Heat of the Night, which went on to win a ton of accolades, including being nominated for seven Academy Awards and winning five of them, including Best Picture, film studios realized that there was considerable pull towards less known demographics. Thus brought the 70s and the era of black exploitation, an ethnic subgenre which often perpetuated black stereotypes. These films were aimed at black audiences, but soon found appeal across racial lines. Now, there were many films made during this area, which some have said to have been unfairly labeled under the black exploitation, even more recent films such as Django Unchained. The D is silent. But there was no denying that film studios recognized there was gold in them hills. But an increased number of black characters in films meant that there was an increased likelihood that they would die in horror films. And with the end of the 70s came the end of the black exploitation genre. But by this point, audiences were used to seeing minority characters in film. And where it used to be odd to have a black or other ethnic minority character in film, now it was odd to not have one. 
Thus, tokenism came into play, casting one minority character amongst a sea of white ones. Except for 1987's Predator, which had a surprisingly diverse cast, even though almost all of them die. Now, don't get me wrong, tokenism exists with regards to gender, disability, and the LGBT plus community. But today, we're just going to focus on the racial aspect, because we will be here all day. So now we have the expectation of wanting to see minority characters in film, but not necessarily wanting them to be the main character. And so creates first death, adding to the body count, sidekick, and heroic death. Basically, how can we kill our expendable minority characters without making it so obvious that that's what we're doing? And this trope exists across all genres, not just horror. Like in Spider Baby, the first death is there for shock value. It tells the audience, wake up, we're killing people. You typically don't care about these characters because their deaths occur before you even really get to know them. And typically their screen time is minuscule at best. These are Mr. Hansen in Gremlins, the unnamed gatekeeper in Jurassic Park, and Mr. Teasdale in Red Dawn. Adding to the body count. These are minor side characters. You know them, you might even like them. But we need the audience to take the antagonist seriously, so they get the axe with very little screen time. These include Vernita Green in Kill Bill, Momodu Athi in Underwater, and Ray Arnold in Jurassic Park. Hold on to your butts. The sidekick. This is a character that has an actual role in the plot and typically significant screen time with regards to other characters. The sidekick is also the most recognizable category of the trope, since it's a way for the film to gut punch the audience while still meeting the minority character has a significant role in this film quota. Notable examples are Dick Holleran in The Shining, Bubba in Forrest Gump, Rue in The Hunger Games, and Preston Packard in Kong Skull Island. As usual, remember, Hold on to your butts! And finally, heroic sacrifice. These are the most notable character deaths because they usually serve to save the white protagonist or, more preferably, they have to sacrifice themselves to save humanity. This is Dr. Miles Dyson in Terminator 2, Dr. Silas Stone in the Snyder Cut of Justice League, and Dr. Robert Neville in I Am Legend. Science rules. Also, as you can tell by my examples, it's often the same actors who are killed on screen over and over again. All right, so let's take out race for a moment. When you think of actor with the most on-screen deaths, who do you typically think of? Sean Bean, right? What you say? Oh, that you only meant well. And with 29 on-screen deaths in both film and TV, he is pretty high up there. I mean, that man knows how to die. But he's actually beaten out by Tony Todd, who has 36 on-screen deaths across film and TV. Death doesn't like to be cheated. Fun fact though, the actor with the most on-screen deaths is actually Christopher Lee, who has been killed 70 times on film. So you have chosen death. So now you know how we got to The Blackening, a comedy horror film directed by Tim Story and written by Tracy Oliver and Dwayne Perkins. Dwayne Perkins also acts in the film and he's actually really funny. <laughs> Now, to be honest, I only saw a teaser for this, and so I didn't know what to expect going into the film, and it definitely plays like a scary movie than an actual horror film, but with a lot of the early 2000s over-the-top raunchiness removed and replaced with actual wit and jokes that land. It pokes fun at genre and racial stereotypes to the point of almost sometimes feeling a little too heavy-handed, especially at the beginning when there is a little bit of an exposition dump. But once it gets going, the film really works to make a statement without taking itself too seriously. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go into spoilers with this one because it's pretty self-explanatory, but I will say this. The female characters in this film are the ones who actually get shit done. What black women gotta save everyone all the damn time? Whereas more often the guys just either complain to or about each other. Also, I have to give a shout out to X Mayo, who plays Shanika in the film and is honestly my favorite character. She knows how to handle herself and is always the first one to jump into action. Everything that I wish that the final girl would typically do in horror films, she does. Plus I gave her a shout out on my Twitter and she totally liked and commented on my post. And yeah, I only have three Twitter followers. Why? Like, you should go follow me. Especially if you want to hear my random thoughts on movies I don't post about here and me talk about my cat. He's cute. Overall, I found The Blackening very funny and well-made, and it actually wanted to make me look into The Black Guy Dies First trope. Which, if any of you are interested, go check out The Black Guy Dies First by Dr. Robin R. Means Coleman and Mark H. Harris for any further insights on how this all came to be. Now, the writing was decent most of the time, but I did find myself getting a little bit annoyed at the characters for how often they would just do stupid things, like just standing around talking instead of trying to save themselves in this situation. I was just... I found myself just clenching my fist being like, what are you doing? Move! I'm sure that was part of the satire, but I did want them to act a little bit more 
believably and intelligently, which really only Shanika did. So rather than a number like scoring between 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 or a letter grade like I know a lot of people do, I came up with a scoring system that I feel like translates to my level of rewatchability. At the top we have 100% would watch it again. Film was amazing, even if it wasn't perfect, I loved it. Next we have would watch it again if I was in the right mood. Pretty self-explanatory, there were a few things I didn't like, so I wouldn't always be down for it. Put it on in the background while I'm doing other things. Maybe it has a handful of scenes that I like, but not enough to sit down and watch the whole thing. Probably best intoxicated with friends. If you know, you know. Absolutely not, never again. Something like Cats 2019 or that Cleopatra documentary I had to watch over and over again. So I'm gonna give this film a rating of would watch it again if I was in the right mood. Go see it in theaters if you can. I did have to drive 30 miles to find a theater that was actually showing it and it only had one show time for the entire day and it had only been out for less than two weeks. Welcome to Utah. So if you see it in theaters, let me know what you think and also let me know what you thought of my shallow deep dive into this trope. Always, whether you agree or disagree, let me know in the comments down below. I love hearing from you guys and all of your discussions that you were having on my last video about no hard feelings. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you to all my new subscribers. So happy to have you. Please like, subscribe, and follow me on all my social medias. My shop is linked down below, so if you'd like to help support my endeavors, please head on over there and get yourself some homemade goodies. Yes, I make all the things. I do have my Spartan next Saturday, which I'm a bit nervous about. I don't know whether or not I'm gonna die on that mountain because it's a beast, which is 13 miles plus 30 obstacles. What was I thinking? <laughs> I will definitely be doing a reaction video next week because I do not wanna have to do any research or anything leading up to that. This week is just gonna be me focusing on getting ready for my race. <laughs> the video might be a little bit late because if I am just so exhausted, I'm not gonna make myself film and edit a video, I'm sorry. <laughs> you might get the video on maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. Also, I'll try to be posting in my shorts, so make sure you check that out if you wanna see me updating all my fitness stuff. Everyone, please have a wonderful week and I will hopefully see you all next Monday. Bye. Okay, best on-screen death of all time, I would have to say is actually Samuel L. Jackson at Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere. They're setting him up to be the hero. It is so perfect. I freaking love that movie. Of course it's a shark movie, so of course I'm gonna love it, but it's just, it, it, it subverts tropes. Like, the girl you think is gonna be the final girl, she gets killed. One of the black guys actually does survive, which is so funny that there's actually a question in the blackening of like, name a film where a black man survives and instantly my brain is like, LL Cool J in Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, Samuel L. Jackson died, but he survived.